I think you have enough energy to, for the last lecture of the day. Uh, Yutin is giving the second lecture of the intro to scanning up interest. Well, more like the third. <laughs> Doesn't matter. <laughs> Let's get merged together. <laughs> Okay, so uh, we pretty much uh, did uh, study a lot about the, the possible three-point interactions uh, determined by the various symmetries that you have in your theory. So we're going to move forward, and we're going to go beyond three points. And now I, we can ask, uh, what do we expect beyond three points? So if I want to, is it completely fixed, or, what, or in which, if it's not, then in which sense part of it can be fixed, and, and, very, and so and so forth. So we want to answer that question. So what do we expect? Well, first of all, of course, because it's, it's still a scattering amplitude, so for example, if it's massless, then we still uh, expect it to have the correct helicity weight. So we still have this constraint beyond three points. Now, but beyond three points, uh, we have some new, some new features. And that is that now, uh, if we're at just at tree level, we expect to have now possible singularities. Why? Because beyond three point, like for example, we have uh, a, 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 part, uh, a multi particle scattering, and it's possible to tune your kinematics such as start pr uh, producing intermediate on shell particles. So the fact that you're producing on shell particles means that now you're in, in a scattering amplitude, it behaves as a singularity. And that means that uh, we would expect that there's going to be a physical pulse. And by physical, it means that these singular, singularity always appear in the form of P1 plus P2 plus various sum of uh, momentum, Pj squared. So we, we, now we expect to see these uh, physical poles uh, beyond three points. So, uh, not, so we c we're allowed to have singularity, it's just that these singularity correspond to particular uh, real physical processes. Now furthermore, we not, we not only do we know what these singularities are, because these singularity corresponds to producing uh, re real physical onshell particles uh, here, that means that the residue of the singularity is actually a product of one amplitude multiplied by the other amplitude, right? Because now, because this particle is bec becoming onshell, if you just look at this part of the diagram, you see that this is actually uh, corresponds to multi-particle scattering with all the particles also uh, on uh, on shell part of your physical state, so that means that you know that the residue of this physical pole must equal to some product of lower point amplitudes. Okay, for Q bigger or equal to one. Okay, so the the reason I I mean, you see, I mean, you can easily see that this f falls into this pattern. It must have, it's going to be, the total number of legs is going to be n plus 2 because you have two extra internal legs here. So you can see that this is going to, this corresponds to n minus q, q plus q, uh, q plus 2 with uh, q bigger than 1. Okay? So these are the new features that we're going to have uh, beyond three points. And now we're going to just give it a test run and see what kind of uh, constraints do these two new features give us. Okay, yes? Um, wouldn't I also expect cuts associated? Yes, with indeed, cuts? yes. So we would, if we have, um, we have loop corrections, then we would have cuts. And then, then all I need to change is that here, instead of physical poles, I, ha I should have physical discontinuities, which means that all the cuts should correspond to these Mandelstam variables. Uh, in, 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 in these variables, and then the discontinuity will again be products of lower point, uh, 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 sorry, not lower point, but lower order and perturbation theories. And um, yeah, but the, we'll discuss this tomorrow when we're t we talk about generalized cuts. So here I'm just going to focus on tree. Okay, so now we're going to do a test run to see what constraints can, can we have here. So now I'm going to try to just guess what is the answer for the four point interaction of a bunch of vectors. So my 1 and 2 is minus helicity, and 3 and 4 is plus helicity. OK, I'm going to try to construct the answer using the, using the constraints that I have here. OK, now, so of course, it needs to have the correct helicity weight. So uh, let me just uh, write it. Uh, OK, let me do it this way. So first of all, let's just see what constraints does, does these uh, new, new uh, conditions that I have uh, corresponds to. So let's say if we have 1, 2, and 3, 4. And so let's say, let's look at the singularity, where this is the, what we call the S-channel singularity, 
where we have it's, pr it's, com it's a singularity that corresponds to a production of an S channel real particle. So here this would be 1, 2, and then this would be 3, 4. Okay? So this, uh, the singularity will have this, will have a product of three point amplitudes. So I can just directly write the three point amplitude down. So this will be one, two, using what we have in the morning. Two, so let me do one, two, so let me call this uh, internal momentum P. Okay, so two P and then P one. And then on the other side, I have uh, 4, 3 to the third power, and then 3p, and then p4. OK, so this, should be, this will be the residue that I should see. Once I get this function, this function should reproduce this, ver this residue on the S-channel pole. OK, so in order, to see what the, in order to see what precisely this constraint looks like, I want to massage this into something that is only in terms of external particles, in, in, in the momentum of external particles. Remember, now I'm, everything is going outgoing. So my momentum P is going to be, uh, for momentum conservation, is going to be minus P1 minus P2, or equal to plus P3 plus P4, OK? So that means that I can now, first of all, I can group this together. So 2P, P4. Now, since this is a lambda P and this is a lambda tilde P, this just gives you the momentum P, right? This is just corresponding me to me writing the momentum in terms of an angle, a, a lambda and a lambda tilde. So I can replace this by 2. I can choose either to be minus P1 minus P2 or P3 plus P4. Let me choose the first one. So it's going to be equal minus P1 minus P2 and then sandwich with the square bracket. You can check that this, the Lorentz indexes work out, right? Because here the P is a bispinner, has a, it has an alpha index and an alpha dot index. This is a lambda tilde, it has an alpha dot index. This is a lambda, it has an alpha index, so it contracts this correctly. All right, so now obviously here the, the angle bracket 2 hitting the, hitting the P2 here. Oh, sorry, this should be plus because I have the overall minus sign. So the angle, angle bracket hitting the P2 here is going to be 0, right? Because P2 has a lambda 2, so that means when it contract with this angle bracket 2, you're going to get the, the angle inner product with the same 2 in there, so it has, it's going to be 0. So that means that this is just giving me 2, 1, 1, 4, okay? And similarly, uh, I can group these two together and using the similar argument, now I'm going to identify P equals to P3 plus P4, then this tells me that this is just 3, 4, 4, 1 through momentum conservation. So that means that this residue here is simply just 1, 2 to the, fact, to the third powers, 4, 3 to the third power, divided by, here I'm going to flip this into 1, 2, and the minus sign goes away, 1, 4, 4, 1, and then 3, 4. Okay, so here this cancels this up to 2. This, I can cancel this, and also I'm just going to write it in this form so that there's no minus sign. And so this tells you that the residue is just given in terms of 1, 2, square, 3, 4, square, over t. Okay, so now I've written everything in terms of my uh, external momentum. Okay, so, that, so what, what is this telling me? This is telling me, telling me that whatever I write down for this object here, on the S-channel residue, it must produce this thing. Okay, on the S-channel pole, it must pre-produce uh, this residue here. Okay, uh, we can list the other residue doing the same computation. So if you want to look at the T-channel, so the T-channel residue, sure. 
That's very good. Actually, the fact that it has a singularity here at T channel is actually telling us that this, this, this amplitude is highly constrained. Because the fact that, so what does this actually mean? So that it means that once you, cons you, you, cons you, you glue everything together and you get the S-channel residue, the S-channel residue contains information about what the T-channel factorization should look like. So it's actually tying together. So even though they're different factorization channels, the information are actually uh, included mutually. So it, now you have a constraint that uh, you need to have the correct thing to reproduce both the S-channel and also the T-channel. Okay. OK, so let's look at the T channel. Uh, we don't need to do the computation. I'm just going to uh, give the answer. So let's say we have a, let me label things like this. OK, and after a short computation, you're going to get, uh, again, T 1, 2 square, 3, 4 square. Of course, this is not really the complete answer because you already know in the morning discussion that here I really need to dress it with uh, the, my coupling constant. So I have 1, 2, A, F, 3, 4, A. Here I also have F, 2, 3, A, F, 4, 1, A. Okay? Good. OK, so these are the things. And of course, I have the corresponding U channel that I need to match to. So let's, let's, try to, let's try to write down an ansatz that gives factorized correctly, that gives these, these residue. Now, of course, remember that with the, what are the conditions that we need to have? We need to have the correct helicity weight. And we need to have the correct physical poles that allows us to factorize uh, correctly. And on the physical pole, we need to have the correct residue. So since, uh, it, once you look at the residue, you see, oh, I, I still have the 1, 2 angle, the 3, 4 square is appearing the same, it's, it's appearing overall. And actually, you, you expect that, right? Because these are actually carrying the, the, the required little group index. Because 1, 2 is minus, and 3, 4 is plus. So let me write down an ansatz. So ansatz will be 1 angle, 1, 2 square, 3, 4 square. OK, because obviously once my ansatz look like this, it obviously it has a potential of matching uh, the residue. Uh, the denominator of your t-channel residue, is that also t? What is that? Oh, sorry. What am I doing? No, this is minus u. Minus. Okay. Right. Sorry. Sorry. That was uh, good. So let's say I'm right, right, I'll write this down. And then I, I, since here, in principle, I should have, I have a T-channel pole uh, in, in my residue. And remember that this was sitting on an S-channel an S channel singularity. So let me say, let's say we have something like ST, some, some factor over ST. Now just, just for, uh, the, just for uh, con containing all the possible poles, let me say, say that I have STA, and I have TUB, and then plus SUC. OK, where A, B, C for now is arbitrary. OK, now what do I do? Well, then let, let, let me try to fix A, B, and C uh, by looking at the factorization channels, right? It has to match uh, at each. Uh, so let me just do it explicitly. So for example, here it tells me that on S channel factorization, I should get this residue. Now here, if we look at this ansatz, we see that uh, what contribute to the S channel is this guy and this guy. Right, on S channel, but now you see that oh yeah, it naturally has this uh, the the residue will, uh, will naturally have this uh, non-local pole here, and has a T factor here. But you say oh no, but here this has a U power, this has a power of U, and so naively you will say oh then that that means that just means that C has to be zero. However, that is not the case because remember that momentum conservation tells you that is that S plus T plus U is actually equal zero. Since, I'm, since here I'm setting uh, on s equals 0, that tells you t is equal to negative u. Okay? So this actually can contribute. It can contribute as a negative, negative t. Okay? So matching the s channel constraint, that tells you that, so matching the s channel, the s channel constraint tells you that a minus c has to be equal to that factor. F one two A F three four A. Right? 
Okay, that's what the S-channel constraint is telling you. Now we can see what the T-channel constraint is telling you. Or you do the same thing with the T-channel, and then you get that A. So if we look at the T-channel, we will be looking at these two. Right? Now here you have, now, so here you have uh, B, which is, uh, which is OK. But now you have, you have A over T. Now you say, oh, this is minus U. This is not, oh, sorry, A over S. But you say this is minus U. This is, this is plus u, so this has a minus sign for b, but this is, this is minus u. But remember, when t equals 0, s is equal to minus u. So you can, you can view this minus u as actually a 1 over s. Okay? So that tells you that the, here you have 1a minus b is e going to equal to f23a, f41a. And similarly, if you do the u channel, residue matching, you're, now you're going to force C minus B equals to F24 A F31 A. Okay? So we have three unknowns and we have three equations and you see that uh, in principle you can be solved, right? But actually this actually tells you more because you know that you, if you take this equation minus this equation plus this equation is actually zero, right? So not only the, 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 can you actually solve these coefficients, it's actually telling you that these, that originally what we call arbitrary coupling constant, actually must satisfy an algebraic structure, okay? What does it satisfy? This is exactly the Jacobi identity that Zvi was telling you about. So, if you, so that means that you must have F12A, F34A, plus F23A, F14A, plus F42A, F13A. I secretly started flipping th things just to, just to make things. Uh, sorry, this is 42. Here I'm flipping it two times so I don't get a, uh, get a minus sign. So the same is that this is 0. And you can see that this is nothing but just write down F, just keep one fix and 2a, uh, f3, 4a, and do plus the cyclic uh, uh, rotation of 2, 3, 4. It equals 0, which is the Jacobi identity. OK? So what is this telling us? This is cool, right? Because all we're doing is that we're writing something. We, so first of all, we know the three points. So the three point fixes our residue. And so once you write down a general ansatz, and by forcing you to satisfy the three point, it's actually the consistency condition is actually telling you that this three point uh, for this three point coupling constant that you have must satisfy this algebraic identity in order for everything to, or in order for you to get a, uh, a consistent four point interaction. And what is this identity telling you? That's telling you that there's an underlying Lie two algebra, right? Because this is precisely the the, el the the identity that you get if these F A B Cs that you started with was actually the structure constant of a two of, of a Lie algebra. Right. So you can uh, you get that, that there's an underlying Lie algebra in your in, in interacting theory of uh, of your spin one particle, okay. And so we see that indeed just looking at the just going be, be, just going to four point just looking at the the, the constraints on your physical poles, uh, that actually tells you a lot of in, in, a lot of non-trivial information. So this tells you that. The Yang Mills amplitude, then you can solve for ABC in terms of these structure constant, in terms of these structure constant, you get the complete uh, Yang Mills amplitude at four points. You can do the same analysis for gravity. So let's, let's see for gravity what would happen. Well, for gravity, we, uh, all I need to do is just modify some of the stuff here. So here, first of all, we, we make this all two times the original thing because now I'm looking at spin two. So that means that all I need to do is just make this a, a square. It's just a square of Yang Mills. The three point is just a square of Yang Mills. And so that means that here, in the end, I'm going to get just this becomes a power, just becomes four power, and then I get t squared. Right? So, but now, now my ansatz is going to be even more simpler. So again, I'm my ansatz is going to be one, two to the fourth. 3, 4 to the fourth. Now you might say, oh, wait a minute, I, ha I have a problem here. This is t squared. Now t squared looks like a double pole, 
right? It looks like a, a two, uh, the, the, the two times the Feynman propagator. It doesn't really make sense. However, again, you have to remember that uh, s plus t plus u is equal to zero. So this apparent t square thing here might be just a t multiplied by u. It's just that in s equals zero, it looks like a t square, right? So that means that the natural thing you will write down is just s t u. Right, so that when you're sitting on s, you just get t times u, and that becomes a t square. And similarly, you can immediately see that on the t channel, if you just square that, that also gives you the correct, when, it, when you're sitting on t channel, s is equal to minus u. And so you also get the correct u square that you get in the, in, in the t channel factorization. So you get the correct, well, I mean, just basically the fact that this is uh, up, up to this overall uh, spinner dependent bracket, this is completely stu symmetric which tells you that it must, once it matches the S channel, it's going to match the T and the U channel. Okay, and so this is it. That's the correct gravity answer. Okay. Okay, so, and, and then you can say, oh, what, uh, but what about if I look at higher spin? So instead of plus two, let me just put minus L, just an arbitrary spin here. Then this will just change this into L and you see that this, what changes is that this becomes 2L, this becomes 2L, and this becomes L power, right? But now you see the problem, right? So f f when, when, when you had spin 1, it was just a T, and we know that we can, oh, sorry, when it was spin 1, it was just T, and we can interpret this as the factorization pole in the other channel. For spin 2, it was T squared, we can interpret it as T and U. It's just that in degenerate, degenerate limit, uh, when s equals 0, u equals t, and therefore you see a t square. But when you go beyond spin 2, you're just going to get t to an even more higher and higher power, and you run out of the, the various tricks we had, right? And now you're, you're, you inevi inevitably, you're going to face with the fact that you're going to have higher order poles. You cannot escape it. So that means that tells you that for spin greater than 2, you're not so the consistency of the four-point interaction tells you you cannot have consistent interacting theory of masses particle beyond spin two, okay? Just from the fact that you're going to get these uh, these double poles, okay? Uh, so uh, as a homework, what you can try to do, the magic work is homework here. So you can you can say, oh, so 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 now I've proven to you that there cannot be an interacting theory with involving masses higher spin. Can I have a free theory? involving masses higher spin. You might say that maybe a free theory is okay. okay. Well, if, if, if you still believe in equivalence principle, which means that everything couples to gravity the same way, then that means that even though this massless higher spin particle is free, it still couples to gravity, right? So you can run the same argument, and except that all you need to do is change this to be minus two plus two. So this will be two gravitons coupling to this ar arbitrary higher spin particle. And of course, you can still write down their three-point interaction, which is completely fixed. And then you can show that even if your higher, point, uh, uh, higher spin particle is not self-interacting, but the fact that it couples to gravity, uh, you can compute this four-point, and you can uh, again see that in, in eventually, uh, inevitably, you're still going to hit that higher pole problem. Okay, so this will be a homework for you to just work, work the, these things out in detail. And, so, and therefore, even if your higher spin particle is non-interacting, the fact that it couples to gravity still forces it to be inconsistent. And so basically, mass is higher spin, even if it's free, is still inconsistent theory in the presence of gravity. Okay. Okay, so let me make some general comments. As a, as a summary of we, what we've seen so far in the morning and the afternoon. Uh, excuse me. Yes. Why didn't you put any Fs when you went to gravity? Uh, because my three-point uh, didn't need any F, right? Okay, so that's a good question. I probably didn't, uh, I should stress that. So remember when, when, when in the morning, why do we have the F? It was because the Bose symmetry here has anti-symmetry. When you exchange one, two, it has an extra minus sign, right? When I'm, when I'm looking at gravity, this becomes square. Now, the inter interchange, it doesn't have a minus sign anymore. So in principle, I can have a single spin, spin two particle because that minus sign is no longer there. So, I can ha so it's not going to be zero. And that's why I don't have that. OK, so let me just make some general comments. at this point.
So first of all, like what kind of theories are, are we are, are like all of these discussion applicable? Of course, first of all, I'm using massive kinematics, but as I mentioned in the morning, you can also use massive kinematics, and you, all you need to do is just change the massless spinner helicity just to, to into massive spinner helicity, change the U1 counting into the SU2 counting, and then you can also work through all the various consequences. So this is applicable, and basically it's applicable to any theory that has a weakly coupled parameter that has weakly coupled or expansion this parameter can be either dimensionless or dimensionful okay so for example, it's a, this, can, this parameter can be dimensionless or dimensionful. So for example, when you have in Yang Mills, basically you have the one over, so you have the one over G coupling uh, sitting in front of this, which is dimensionless. When you have gravity, you have the one over kappa in front, which is dimensionful. And if you gener generically, if you have some effective field theory, where you have tons of infinite numbers of higher dimension operator, then you can have these higher dimension operators that are with 1 over lambda uh, to p suppress uh, coefficients. And you can still talk about these coefficients in terms of this expansion, 1 over lambda p. OK, so this is not just applicable. So all the things that we discussed here is just not, not, it's not just applicable uh, to, the, to the models that we, that's going to be discussed in the, in the lecture. Because of course, uh, there's, uh, we're, 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 we're only going to be able to cover a finite number of them, but really there's a large class of things you can start discussing, DRS matrix and consistency conditions and so forth, and, and uh, apply these methods to, to study them. And the, re and the reason that I need weakly coupled parameter is because basically, as you said, as, and as some people already asked, here I'm really just looking, doing analysis, just looking at rational functions, right? I haven't talked about cuts yet. And so the, the fact that you have a weakly coupled parameter is basically for you to be able to separate out the rational piece from the cuts. OK, that's, so that's basically the technical reason that, that I need that. And so, so, the way, so once I have that, then I can study, the, 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 can separate the pure rational piece. And for this pure rational piece, whenever I have poles, the residue of the poles are determined are determined by lower by lower point amplitudes. Okay, so in other words, once you know the lower point amplitude, you can determine the higher point amplitude by looking at the re that, at looking at the residue of those poles, just like what we have here, right? We have the four point amplitude, and we write down an ansatz for the four point amplitude, and we can fix that ansatz in terms of the residue that we get by gluing together the three point amplitude, right? Uh, of course, and this actually not only does it. The, can you fix your answer? But also, it gives you non-trivial, non-trivial, uh, non-trivial information about uh, the the possible interactions you can have at three points. However, this only fixes this again. So this is the operation work is it fixes the the pole, the, the residues of your pole. So of course, w w once it fixes that, but then that means that there's still polynomial terms are undetermined. So this in, so at any point. The four, so basically, at any point of just one second. So at any point of your amplitude, whenever you have poles, the residue of that pole is, fixed, is determined by the local by the, the lower point amplitude. This you can turn this information around, and that tells you that what is not fixed at gen, a general endpoint is just going to be pure uh, polynomial terms. Okay, so pole. Okay, and this makes sense, right? Because, for example, we can add any, 
higher dimension operators to our, to our Lagrangian. And all of these higher dimension operators, in principle, we can always add them. Uh, they're gauge invariant. They can, you can make them to res in general to respect any uh, global symmetry that you have. And of course, they, they should have random coefficients when we, when we, when we add them to our, actions, uh, to our action. A priori, their coefficients is not fixed, right? So that means there must, uh, the, this non-uniqueness must, must appear in your scattering amplitude. And indeed, it does appear in the fact that when you're trying to use this bootstrap method to start with the lower point and start bootstrapping to higher point, you always have this polynomial ambiguity. And actually, you can turn this around. The space of your polynomial an ambiguity actually precisely corresponds to the space of the higher dimension operator that is possible to add to, the, to, to your action. OK, so what is the question? To all order in what? So I'm just looking at tree. So right now, this is just a tree statement. So yeah, this is so. Yeah. So if you yeah yeah. So if you have if you have the. Um, I, I'm not sure if there's any caveat. I don't think there's any caveat. But uh, but in, in, so if you, if you have multi loops, then of course then you the, the question is: Are you looking at one pi or not one pi diagrams? And and basically, so uh, if you have poles, then the poles, the factorization of the the, pole, the singularity on that pole. Uh, if you just have, for example, if your question is: If I have some higher loop computation, higher loop diagram like this, where these are loops. And, the quest and your question is whether or not the singularity of this pole should correspond to the product of two loop amplitudes. Is that the question? Uh, not exactly. So what would be the scenario that you're asking? Because this would be the correspond to the higher order yeah, yeah, it's statement. It's, it's clear, yeah. yeah, so so then it should be factorized. But not to the same value. Like, so basically, the question is the residue is not uh, the same at all orders, right? Oh, of course. No, no, no. The residue, of course. The residue is, is, is a coupling constant dependent. Yes, sure. OK. So yes, nice. Yeah, you match this number of polynomials with the number of operators. So you uh, clarify the number of operators is after you use equations. Yes. Uh, so yeah. So the number you're interested in, but it's not the naive number of operators. Yeah. Of course, uh, yeah. So uh, as, and this is actually points to the, to the advantage of doing things on shell. Because the, here, the, the number of polynomial terms, we're basically, to, these are, we're looking at the matrix element that are on shell. So you can, have very, you can have different operators that look differently, but are actually produce the same matrix element. And the reason that they produce the same matrix element is because on equation motion or integration by parts, or even just field redefinition, they're actually the same operator. So actually, this way of determining what are the possible operators is actually more in, a, a more on shell and more invariant way of determining what are actually the real independent. Uh, degrees of operators that you can have, okay? And so just to let you, so this is a fun thing that I like to do. So uh, just to let you see how powerful these constraints look like. So let's try to do another example. Uh, let me see. So we've seen that, so we've seen in the previous, in two lectures before, the string theory answer of four-point interactions. And we can see how string th theory answer just drop out, drop out of these uh, requirements. Okay, so let's start with uh, so let's just start with gravity. So I've already constructed what the four-point gravity looked like. So n we know that the four-point gravity looks like again. I'm just rewrite it. Let's reproduce it. Okay. Now, as usual, we can do uh, momentum counting. So here we see, uh, we, so remember, the uh, angle bracket is like one momentum, right? Because it has two lambdas in there. So here you have four momentum, four momentum. You have six momentum downstairs. That means at high energy, this thing scales as e to the square, right? So this is the usual statement that you have this bad high energy behavior for gravity. OK, so let's say if we want to modify this theory by including higher, now new particle states, OK? New, new massive states in here such that you can tame this high energy behavior. Now what that means is that that means that the real true UV completed four point function will uh, involve a bunch of massive poles. So now and also because of permutation invariance, you know that once a massive pole is going to, once a massive particle is appearing in S channel, it should be appearing in all both T 
S, T, and U with some numerator factor. OK, so again, I'm doing the same thing as ju I'm just doing the same thing. I'm just guessing the answer. OK, I haven't told you what the mass is. I haven't told you how, num how many number of massive particles I need. Oh, sorry. Yeah, these are m squared. And then I just um, have some numerator factor. Now I'm going to use my constraint, right? Here I'm going to say that, uh, that uh, so this is just four points. So on the physical pose, it should correspond to the product of three points. So now I'm including all these massive, new massive new poses. So now I need to go to the, all of these new massive poses and look at the residue of, of those massive poses and require that it corresponds to the three point. Of course, I'm not going to list all the possible three point interactions such that this, this uh, such that it matches in, in particular because, of course, I don't even know what these states are precisely, right? I mean, when we were determining the three point interaction, you need to know what the three part, the, the three explicit states are in order to determine it. Not to mention that these are actually massive particles. So, uh, so that means that one of the states is actually massive. However, there's a, there's a very, already a very first order constraint. Is that let's imagine you're looking at s equals to m, let's say m1 squared. If I look at s equal to m1 squared, what do you get? You get this complicated function with s. So when s equals to m1 squared, the residue is going to be proportional to this 1, 2 factor, 3, 4 factor over, now s is already m1 squared, so then I'm going to put m1 squared tu multiplied by this entire thing which is going to be m1 squared minus mi squared, where I have product of i not equals to 1. Now I have u minus mi squared and t minus mi squared. And then I have n, which is m1 squared t. Now, of course, here, the u, using momentum conservation, I can write it as minus t minus m1 squared, because s is equal to m1 squared. OK, here's a, here's a crucial point, right? This is just a complicated mess. More, and more importantly, this mess is, not even, is completely non-local, right? It, it, this has a lot of these massive non-local poles. Now, previously, you say, oh, but here we are, we, we, we've seen that there's non-locality here as well. But remember, this non-locality wasn't a problem, because this, when, when, when t equals to 0, now this corresponds to the other part, which is, which is starting to factorize. And actually, all the, it's just like exactly like when we had in the three point, when the denominator is, is, go, is, has, is going to the degenerate, then you have basically 0 over 0. You're just counting zeros, And you have more zeros on top than compared to the bottom. But for massive poles, you cannot have massive double poles. Okay, so when I'm sitting at s equals to m1 squared, I cannot have these poles sitting here. So these are com extremely long local. So what does that tell you? That tells you that, tells you that all of these massive poles here must be canceled by whatever is sitting on top. They cannot just be there sitting there, uh, just be sitting there random, um, not random, and just still present. So the statement about that it course factorizes correctly on the three point is right now. For I'm just using it that I'm just using the state, that, that statement in the sense that I'm sitting on the, any of the massive pole s equal to m1 square. The residue has to be a local polynomial. And this is obviously not a local polynomial. And therefore, what that tells you is that this numerator needs to completely cancel the denominator. Now, the numerator is a single function of t. The denominator is also a single function of t with particular, uh, you can say that they have particular roots. right? Any single function of t and giving you a set of roots, that determines a part of that single function. right? It just needs to be a product of those roots. So that means that here must be, once s equal to m1 squared, must be a product of these roots, at least proportional to a product of these roots to cancel that. So what does that mean? That means that when s equal to m1 squared, any of these poles evaluated on its, uh, on its uh, when it's 0, for example, t equals to m2 squared, this must correspond to a 0, because it's a, it's a proportion to those roots. So that tells you that this num numerator is actually satisfied that when s equals to mi square and t equals to some random mj square, this has to be always 0 in order to avoid non-polynomial residue. OK? So let me just propose that I write this explicitly out. So 
since I want to cancel those zero, so that means I should just write it out explicitly, those double poles. So let me write s plus u minus mi squared minus mj squared. So this will be a product of mj. So t plus u minus mi squared minus mj squared. And u plus s minus mi squared minus mj squared. OK, again, why am I writing it in this form? It's because I, once I write it in this form, then I'm guaranteed that whenever I'm sitting on a double pole, there's going to be a 0 to cancel that double pole. We have two factors of s plus u. Oh, sorry. So this is s plus t. Yes? Uh, in this case, aren't you always in an uh, unphysical scattering region uh, when both uh, s equals some mi squared and Yes, in, indeed. Uh, as you say, when s is equal to, to, to a positive th thing, t must be negative in, a, in the physical region, yes. But here I'm just talking about the analytic structure of my function, right? So in the analytic structure of my function, I still, I'm not going to be, physically, I'm not going to be able to probe the t-channel pole, that's true. But still, it doesn't change the fact my analytic function has this t-channel singularity, and I have the singularity in the unphysical region. Actually, some, and as you can see already in the three-point example, uh, oftentimes it's, it's useful to go to the unphysical region. To, 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 um, when we're talking about amplitudes. OK? Good. So this ends us from the fact that in the massive pole, the, the, the residue must be a polynomial. It already tells us that naturally we can have this sum sets here, such that it uh, is guaranteed to cancel any uh, non-trivial uh, double poles in the denominator. OK. We're almost there because <coughs> Well, first of all, let me just do a little bit more cosmetic uh, change. Since I know that s plus u is actually t minus t, t plus u is mi actually minus s, I'm going to write this as, uh, so just t, uh, t, take out the overall minus sign. So this is just s, and this is just u. OK? So now I have this function that is guaranteed to factorize into a polynomial whenever I'm sitting on any of the, these massive poles. However, I, haven't, I still haven't looked at what the massless pole residue look like, right? So let's look at what the massless residue. So if I look at s equal to 0, the residue is just going to get, be given by, again, the minus t square factor, which is what we expect here for a spin 2 particle. That's perfectly fine. However, here, so th this is going to be proportional. Here, I'm going to get minus t minus m i square, which is this, this factor here, t minus m i square. And then in the numerator, I'm going to get, so I'm going to forget about this because this is just a constant. So I'm going to get t plus m i square plus m j square. Maybe I should change this into, uh, because this, you might think that these are the same i. I should change this to l. OK, so these are just labels. And then minus t plus ml squared plus mj squared. OK, where this is product over lj. Again, I, ha I still haven't told you what the number of particles I have, and I haven't told you uh, what precise mass they have. But I just see that I have this function. Now again, we have the problem, right? Here, this is a massless residue. So this is a massless uh, non-locality, which is fine, because it just corresponds, again, for this, uh, the three, when it sits on the, the, this extra pole, you just go back to the degenerate three-point interactions. And here, you just talk about 0 cancels 0. But here, this is, this is, uh, this is uh, deadly. Right? Because here you, st you have the massive non-locality, which doesn't correspond to any degenerate limit. So this is not allowed. In order for this to be, so in order for this to be non-lethal, you need, again, that these all cancel out. So you need that this factor, these factors here, can cancel out with this denominator. And this factor here cancels out with this denominator. Right? I'm taking this factor because this has a relative minus sign with my mass. And this is a plus sign. This is a relative plus sign with my mass. So this tells you that in order for this cancel to be even possible, in order for it to be to, to have even possibly completely uh, cancel, 
any two sum any any sum of any sorry the sum of any two masses has to correspond to one of the mass in the denominator, right? Any pair of these Lj, the sum of these two masses, have to correspond to a particular mass in my denominator, right? What does that tell you? That tells you that when I, I need to have a, a, a spectrum of my masses such that if I take any sum, any element in there, of course, it gives to another element in order for this to cancel, right? And if you think about this a little bit more closely, you th you'll see that the natural solution is that my mi square corresponds to some constant, let me call it 1 over alpha, times i, where i is an integer, because the sum of any two integer is an integer. And then, and then I just have this overall constant here that tells me what that scale is, okay? So in other words, we get the string theory answer just by this analysis. So putting everything back, we basically get and we need to have a product of i goes to 1 to infinity for all integers. Now we have just s minus 1 i over alpha, t minus i over alpha, u minus i over alpha. And this is, sorry, this is product i, again, 1 to infinity. And this is s plus i over alpha, t plus i over alpha, and u plus i over alpha. And for those of you who are familiar with gamma functions, you know that this is nothing but, I can put the STU in here. So this is nothing but 1, 2, 4, 3, 4 square, gamma minus S alpha, gamma minus T alpha, gamma minus U alpha. And then the denominator is just 1 plus alpha S, 1 plus alpha U, and 1 plus alpha T. Okay, and so this will be the 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 uh, the type two uh, the type two the four point gravity interaction and type two string theory. Okay, and you see that it's actually kind of kind of kind of nice that that we have these constraints, and if you if you just look at the simplest solution to these constraints, you naturally see the string theory answer uh, coming out of it. And if you look at the string theory answer. And it actually tells you that actually looking at things on shell actually makes the string theory, theory answer more transparent in some sense compared to the world sheet uh, representation. Uh, in some sense, that you see that the reason you have these gamma function products is basically because here the gamma function is, is giving you the necessary poles in your, in the necessary um, massive poles in the various channel. And these gamma functions in the bottom is actually there to cancel all the double poles, right? Because that's what these uh, functions are. Okay, that's where their origin are. So I hope that this convinces you that really just looking at these physical uh, constraints on your on your uh, observable actually tells you a lot about uh, the, the a lot about the possible uh, theories that you can have, and it gives you a, a lot of constraints. And there's some um, and a lot of our interesting theories that we've been studying a lot actually emerges uh, from these uh, analysis in very in sometimes in an unexpected way. Okay, and, and I think I'll talk, maybe we'll get some chance to talk about that uh, in terms of effective field theory, maybe uh, some, a little bit tomorrow. How much time do I have? Uh, you have five minutes. Five minutes? Okay, so let me just uh, give you uh, some, some general, uh, some preview about what I'm going to continue to talk about to, uh, in my next lecture. So here, this is a four point, and you see that uh, what, what I've done here is basically I have the four point, I write down an ansatz and require it to match the residue. I basically fix the four point, and uh, as I mentioned, for generic theories, you, you can in principle fix your answer up to polynomial uh, ambiguity. But of course, even if I can just fix my answer completely, uh, in the absence of polynomial ambiguity, this is really a, a, a tedious way of doing things, right? If I have to go to five point, I have to redo, take the four point and start gluing things together and guess an ansatz and try to match things. And there's, and there's, uh, and so then in my next session, I'm gonna talk about an, uh, an easier way 
uh, to, to uh, do this construction. And this is what is termed the BCFW, uh, the BCFW recursion relation. And the idea is basically very simple. So I'm just going to give the uh, broad stroke of the idea, and then we'll do a little bit more details uh, uh, tomorrow. So the idea is that instead of thinking about mn, my scattering amplitude, I'm going to start. I'm going to deform my scattering amplitude by a complex parameter m and z. Okay, so I'm going to complexify my amplitude, but com complexify it by introducing a new parameter z, and this z is basically equals is defined as mn. And I take, basically take two legs, let's say without loss of general, generality, p1 hat, which is equal to the original p1 plus some zq, and p2 hat is equal to p2 minus zq. Okay, and of course I have the remaining pi's here. Okay, so I'm going to start from my original amplitude. I'm going to deform by two parameters. Now, of course, why do I want to deform this way? What one thing is obvious is that by deforming this way, this is still an amplitude in the sense that all of my uh, pro, uh, is still satisfy momentum conservation, right? Because the deformation actually cancels. For the, furthermore, I'm going to require that q dot p1 equals to q dot p2 equals to 0. And the reason I wanted to require this, oh, furthermore, I also want to require q squared equals 0. The reason I want to do this is because as a consequence of this, then my p hat 1 square will be equal to p hat 2 square, and it will also will be 0. In other words, I'm changing my amplitude a little bit. I'm changing in such a way that still, I, I still have uh, momentum conservation, and all of my, my momentum are still on shell. Of course, what I, another way of saying what I'm, what I'm doing is I'm making it into a complex momentum. Okay. And we'll see this explicitly, why this is actually complex. You were implying a similar sort of thing when we were discussing the three-point amplitude, where the momentum could be complex. Yes, and you actually see that this is really, now this is really complex. Okay, well actually we can see it directly now. So, I'm, so if you look at this, q dot p1 is 0, q dot p2 is 0, and q squared have to be 0. The fact that q squared is, is equal to 0 already tells you that q it has to be a product of spinners, right, because it's null. Right, it has to be a product of spinners. And then the fact that it dotted into P1 equals, and dotted into P2 is equal to zero, that means Q has two solutions. So that means Q can be either lambda one, lambda two, tilde, and, or lambda two, lambda one, tilde. So the, the fact that it's written in this form tells you that Q squared equals zero, and Q dotted into P1, Q dotted into P2 is equal to zero because this is made out of the spinners of one and two. Okay, but I, this is a different choice. If I, if I write down explicitly the Q takes this form, then you see that P1 hat now is going to be nothing but, so first lambda 1, lambda 1 tilde, my plus Z, where Z now, let me, let's use this solution, lambda 1, lambda 2 tilde. I can write this more uh, explicitly as lambda 1, lambda 1 tilde, or more concrete, sim or more uh, simple of, cleaned up version, I can write it in this form. And then in this form, you see that it is complex, right? Because remember, when, when your momentum is real, the lambda tilde part is going to be complex conjugate of the lambda. Here, the lambda tilde, the, the part that is the tilde carrying the, the dotted index is obviously not the complex conjugate of the undotted indices. So that's why it's obviously, by doing this, you're going into complex momentum. Okay, good. So. We're going to deform our momentum or our amplitude into this form, into this z parameter. Then, what I have is that I can write down an identity, which is basically that my endpoint amplitude is obviously corresponds to my deform amplitude evaluated as z equals zero. Right? This is Duh, right, it says if I write as equals zero. I'm gonna make this duh look a little bit more fancier by writing it as a counter integral. Okay, where it's still duh, 
but it looks a little bit more fancy because this, this is a counter that I'm integrating over z, but I'm picking up the z equals zero pole. So still, so these are just identities, okay? But once I write down in terms of a, in terms of a counter integral, you know that on a counter plane, so right now for this counter, I'm basically circling uh, the origin. I can do a counter deformation and start circling the infinity. I can consider the, 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 the opposite one, which is the, 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 the integral over infinity, right? So it's going to be minus, so let's say this is c equals zero, which means I'm circling the zero. It's going to be minus dz over z, where c is encircling the infinity, m and z. Now, of course, by circling the infinity, I'm going to start picking out any non-trivial poles in the finite complex plane, right? But why do I expect that there's any non-trivial uh, poles here? It's because that my amplitude, this is an amplitude, you, you're going to have propagators. And these propagators, because of this deformation that I just, uh, I just had here, because of this deformation, my propagator is also going to have z dependence. And those z dependence will, will pr provide you with non-trivial uh, poles. The residue of those poles is already what you know, right? It's just a factorization of lower points, right? So that means that you know that what the, these residues, you know where these poles are in, 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 the, at the first, in, in the first place, and you also know what the residues are. Okay, so these contributions you can con compute directly. And all you need to worry about is infinity. And so if there's no contribution of infinity, then you can just use these contributions to reconstruct what my original amp answer is. Okay, and this will be basically the gist of the BCFW recursion, which uh, basically we'll talk about in our next lecture. Okay, okay, so we'll stop here. Thank you.